The Forgotten Planet by Sewell Peasley Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Forgotten Planet by Sewell Peasley Wright. I have been asked to record, plainly and without prejudice, a brief history of the Forgotten Planet. That this record, when completed, will be sealed in the archives of the Interplanetary Alliance, and remain there, a secret and rather dreadful bit of history, is no concern of mine. I am an old man, well past the century mark, and what disposal is made of my work is of little importance to me. I grow weary of life and living, which is good. The fear of death was not lost when our scientists showed us how to live until we grew weary of life. But I am digressing an old man's failing. The Forgotten Planet was not always so named. The name that it once bore had been, as every child knows, stricken from the records, actual and mental, of the universe. It is well that evil should not be remembered. But, in order that this history may be clear in the centuries to come, my record should go back to beginnings. So far as the universe is concerned, the history of the Forgotten Planet begins with the visit of the first craft ever to span the space between the worlds, the crude, adventuresome Edorn, whose name, as well as the names of the nine Zinnians who manned her, occupy the highest places in the role of honor of the universe. Amy Beove, the commander and historian of the Edorn, made but brief comment on his stop at the Forgotten Planet. I shall record it in full. We came to rest upon the surface of this, the fourth of the planets, visited during the trip of the Edorn, eighteen spaces before the height of the sun. We found ourselves surrounded immediately by vast numbers of creatures, very different from ourselves, and from their expressions and gestures, we gathered that they were both curious and unfriendly. Careful analysis of the atmosphere proved it to be sufficiently similar to our own to make it possible for us to again stretch our legs outside the rather cramped quarters of the Edorn, and tread the soil of still another world. No sooner had we emerged, however, that we were angrily beset by the people of this unfriendly planet, and rather than do them injury, we retired immediately, and concluded our brief observations through our ports. The topography of this planet is similar to our own, save that there are no mountains, and the flora is highly concentrated, almost without exception, and apparently quite largely parasitical in nature. The people are rather short in stature, with hairless heads and high foreheads. Instead of being round or oval, however, the heads of these people rise to a rounded ridge, which runs back from a point between and just above the eyes, nearly to the nape of the neck behind. They give evidence of a fair order of intelligence, but are suspicious and unfriendly. From the number and size of the cities we saw, this planet is evidently thickly populated. We left about sixteen spaces before the height of the sun, and continued towards the fifth and last planet before our return to Zinnia. This report quite naturally caused other explorers in space to hesitate. There were so many friendly, eager worlds to visit during the years that relations between the planets were being established that unfriendly people were ignored. However, from time to time, as spaceships became perfected and more common, parties from many of the more progressive planets did call. Each of them met with the same hostile reception, and at last, shortly after the second war of the planets, the victorious alliance set a fleet of the small but terrible dauber spears convoyed by four of the largest of the disintegrator ray ships to subjugate the forgotten planet five great cities were destroyed and the control city the seat of the government was menaced before the surly inhabitants conceded allegiance to the alliance parties of scientists fabricators and workmen were then landed and a dictatorship was appointed from all the worlds of the Alliance, instruments and equipments were brought to the Forgotten Planet. A great educational system was planned and executed. The benign and kindly influence of the Alliance made every effort to improve the conditions existing on the Forgotten Planet, and to win the friendship and allegiance of these people. For two centuries the work went on, two centuries of bloodshed, strife, hate, and disturbance. Nowhere else within the known universe was there ill-feeling. 
the second awful war of the planets had at last succeeded in teaching the lesson of peace. Two centuries of effort. Wasted effort. It was near the end of the second century that my own story begins. Commander at the time of the supercruiser Tamon, a special patrol ship of the Alliance, I was not at all surprised to receive orders from the Central Council to report at emergency speed. Special patrol work in those days, before the advent of the present decentralized system, was a succession of false starts, hurried recalls, and urgent emergency orders. I obeyed at once. In the Special Patrol Service, there is no questioning orders. The planet Earth, from which I sprang, is and always has been proud of the fact that from the very beginning, her men have been picked to command the ships of the Special Patrol. No matter how dangerous, how forlorn and hopeless the mission given to a commander of the Special Patrol ship, history has never recorded that any commander has ever hesitated. That is why our uniform of blue and silver commands the respect that it does, even in this day and age of softening and decadence, when men... But again, an old man digresses. And perhaps it is not for me to judge. I pointed the blunt nose of the Tamon at Zinium, seat of the Central Council, and in four hours, Earth time, the great craft swept over the gleaming city of the Central Council and settled swiftly to the court before the mighty, columned hall of the planets. Four pages of the Council, in their white and scarlet livery, met me and conducted me instantly to a little anteroom behind the great Council chamber. There were three men awaiting me there, three men whose faces at the time were familiar to every person in the known universe. Kalin, the oldest of the three, and the spokesman, rose as I entered the room. The others did likewise, as the pages closed the heavy doors behind me. "'You are prompt, and that is good,' thought Kalin. "'I welcome you. Remove now thy menore.' I glanced up at him swiftly. This must surely be an important matter that I was asked to remove my menore band. It will, of course, be understood that at the time we had but a bulky and clumsy instrument to enable us to convey and receive thought, a device consisting of a heavy band of metal in which were embedded the necessary instruments and a tiny atomic energy generator, the whole being worn as a circlet or crown upon the head. Wonderingly, I removed my menore, placed it upon the long dark table around which the three men were standing, and bowed. Each of the three, in turn, lifted their gleaming circlets from their heads and placed them likewise upon the table before them. "'You wonder,' said Colleen, speaking, of course, in the soft and liquid universal language, which is, I understand, still disseminated in our schools, as it should be. "'I shall explain as quickly and briefly as possible. "'We have called you here on a dangerous mission, "'a mission that will require tact and quickness of mind, as well as bravery.' We have selected you, have called you, because we agree that you possess the qualities required. Is it not so? He glanced at his two companions, and they nodded gravely, solemnly, without speaking. You are a young man, John Hansen, continued Colleen, but your record in service is one of which you can be proud. We trust you with knowledge that is so secret, so precious, that we must revert to speech in order to convey it, we dare not trust it, even in this protected and guarded place, to the menore's quicker but less discreet communication. He paused for a moment, frowning thoughtfully, as though dreading to begin. I waited silently, and at last he spoke again. There is a world, and he named a name which I shall not repeat, the name of the forgotten planet, that is a festering sore upon the body of the universe. As you know, for two centuries we have tried to pass on to these people an understanding of peace and friendship. I believe that nothing has been left undone. The Council and the forces behind it have done everything within their power. And now... He stopped again, and there was an expression of deepest pain written upon his wise and kindly face. The pause was but for an instant. And now, he went on firmly, it is at an end. Our work has been undone. Two centuries of effort, undone. They have risen in revolt. They have killed all those sent by the alliance of which this council is the governing body and the mouthpiece, and they have sent us an ultimatum, a threat of war. Kellen nodded his magnificent old head gravely. 
I do not wonder that you start, he said heavily. War! It must not be! It cannot be! And yet, war is what they threaten. But, sir, I put in eagerly, I was young and rash in those days. Who are they to make war against a united universe? I have visited your planet Earth, said Kellen, smiling very faintly. You have a tiny winged insect you call bee, is it not so? Yes. The bee is a tiny thing of little strength. A man, a child, might crush one to death between a thumb and finger, but the bee may sting before it is crushed, and the sting may linger on for days, a painful and unpleasant thing. Is that not so? I see, sir, I replied, somewhat abashed before the tolerant, kindly wisdom of this great man. They cannot hope to wage successful war, but they may bring much suffering to others. Much suffering, nodded Kalin, still gently smiling. And we were determined that this thing shall not be, not, and his face grew gray with a terrible, bitter resolve, not if we have to bring to bear upon that dark and unwilling world the disintegrating rays of every ship of the Alliance, so that the very shell of the planet shall disappear, and no life ever again shall move upon its surface. But this, and he seemed to shudder at the thought, is a terrible and ruthless thing to even contemplate. We first must try once again to point out to them the folly of their ways. It is with this mission that we would burden you, John Hansen. It is no burden, but an honor, sir, I said quietly. Youth, youth, Kalin chided me gently. Foolish, yet rather glorious. Let me tell you the rest, and then we shall ask for your reply again. The news came to us by a small scout ship attached to that unhappy world. It barely made the journey to Jaron, the nearest planet, and crashed so badly from lack of power that all save one man were killed. He, luckily, tore off his manure and insisted in speech that he be brought here. He was obeyed, and, in a dying condition, was brought to this very chamber. Kalin glanced swiftly, sadly around the room, as though he could still visualize that scene. Every agent of the Alliance upon that hateful planet was set upon and killed, following the working out of some gigantic and perfectly executed plan, all save the crew of this one tiny scout ship, which was spared to act as a messenger. Tell your great council, was the message these people sent to us, that here is rebellion. We do not want, nor will we tolerate your peace. We have learned now that upon other worlds than ours there are great riches. These we shall take, if there is resistance, we have a new and terrible death to deal, a death that your great scientists will be helpless against, a horrible and irresistible death that will make desolate and devoid of intelligent life in any world where we were forced to sow the seeds of ultimate disaster. We are not ready yet. If we were, we would not move, for we prefer that your council have time to think about what is surely to come. If you doubt that we have the power to do what we have threatened to do, send one ship, commanded by a man whose words you will trust, and we will prove to him that these are no empty words. That is nearly as I can remember it, concluded Kalin. Is the message. The man who brought it died almost before he had finished. That is the message. You are the man we have picked to accept their challenge. Remember, though, that there are but four of us in this room. There are but four of us who know these things. If you for any reason do not wish to accept this mission, there will be none to judge you, least of all any of us who knows best of all the perils. You say, sir, I said quietly, although my heart was pounding in my throat and roaring in my ears, that there would be none to judge me. Sir, there would be myself, there could be no more merciless judge. I am honored that I have been selected for this task, and I accept the responsibility willingly, gladly. When is it your wish that we should start? The three presiding members of the council glanced at each other, faintly smiling, as though they would say, as Kleen had said in a short time before, Youth! Youth! Yet I believe they were glad and somewhat proud that I had replied as I did. You may start! 
said Kalin. As soon as you can complete the necessary preparations, detailed instructions will be given you later. He bowed to me, and the others did likewise. Then Kalin picked up his manure and adjusted it. The interview was over. What do you make of it? I asked the observer. He glanced up from his instrument. Jaron, sir. Three degrees to port. Elevation between five and six degrees. Approximate only, of course, sir. Good enough. Please ask Mr. Barry to hold his present course. We shall not stop at Joran. The observer glanced at me curiously, but he was too well disciplined to hesitate or ask questions. Yes, sir, he said crisply, and spoke into the microphone beside him. None of us wore menores when on duty, for several reasons. Our instruments were not nearly as perfect as those in day-to-day -day use and verbal orders were clearer and carried more authority than mental instructions. The delicate and powerful electrical and atomic mechanisms of our ship interfered with the functioning of the menores, and at the time, the old habit of speech was far more firmly entrenched due to hereditary influence than it is now. I nodded to the man and made my way to my own quarters. I wished most heartily that I could talk over my plans with someone, but this had been expressly forbidden. I realize that you trust your men, and more particularly your officers, Colleen had told me during the course of his parting conversation with me. I trust them also, yet we must remember that the peace of mind of the universe is concerned. If news, even a rumor, of this threatened disaster should become known, it is impossible to predict the disturbance it might create. Say nothing to anyone. It is your problem. You alone should leave the ship when you land. You alone shall hear or see the evidence they have to present, and you alone shall bring the word of it to us. That is the wish of the Council. Then it is my wish, I had said, and so it had been settled. Aft, in the crew's quarters, a gong sounded sharply, the signal for changing watches and the beginning of a sleep period. I glanced at the remote control dials that glowed behind their glass panel on one side of my room. From the registered attraction of Jaron, at our present speed, we should be passing her within, according to Earth time, about two hours. That meant that their outer patrols might be seeking our business, and I touched Barry's attention button and spoke into the microphone beside my bunk. Mr. Barry, I'm turning in for a little sleep. Before you turn over the watch to Etel, will you see that the nose rays are set for the special patrol code signal for this Enar? We shall be close to Jaron shortly. Yes, sir. Any other orders? No, I'll keep her on her present course. I shall take the watch for Mr. Etel. Since there have been changes since those days, and will undoubtedly be others in the future, it might be well to make clear, in a document such as this, that at this period, all ships of the Special Patrol Service identified themselves by means of invisible ray flashes in certain sequences from the two nose or forward projectors. These code signals were changed every enar, a period of time arbitrarily set by the Council, about 18 days as time is measured on Earth, and divided into 10 periods, as at present known as enarens. These were further divided into enaros, thus giving us a time-reckoning system for use in space, correspondingly roughly to the months, days, and hours of the Earth. I retired, but not to sleep. Sleep would not come. I knew, of course, that if curious outer patrol ships from Jaron did investigate us, they would be able to detect our invisible ray code signal and thus satisfy themselves that we are on the Council's business. There would be no difficulty on that score, but what I should do after landing upon the rebellious sphere, I had not the slightest idea. Be stern, indifferent to their threats, Colleen had counseled me, but do everything within your power to make them see the folly of their attitude. Do not threaten them, for they are surly people, and you might precipitate matters. Swallow your pride if you must. Remember that yours is a gigantic responsibility, and upon the information you bring us may depend the salvation of millions. I am convinced that they are not, you have a word in your language that fits exactly, not pretending, what's the word? Bluffing? I had supplied in English, smiling. 
Right, bluffing. It is a very descriptive word, and I'm sure they are not bluffing. I was sure of it also. They knew the power of the Alliance. They had been made to feel it more than once. A bluff would have been a foolish thing, and these people were not fools. In some lines of research, they were extraordinarily brilliant. But what could their new, terrible weapon be? Rays we had, at least half a dozen rays of destruction, the terrible, dehydrating ray of the Dauber sphere, the disintegrating ray that dated back before Amy Beove and his first voyage into space, the concentrated ultraviolet ray that struck men down in fiery torment. No, it could hardly be a new ray that was their boasted weapon. What, then? Electricity had even been exhausted of all its possibilities. Atomic energy had been released, harnessed, and directed. Yet it would take fabulous time and expense to make these machines of destruction do what they claimed they would do. Still pondering the problem, I did fall at last into a fitful travesty of sleep. I was glad when the soft clamor of the bell aft announced the next change of watch. I rose, cleared the cobwebs from my brain with an icy shower, and made my way directly to the navigating room. "'Everything tidy, sir?' said Attell, my second officer, and a Zinian. He was thin and very dark, like all Zinians, and he had the high, effeminate voice of the people. But he was cool and fearless and had the uncanny celebration of his kind. I trusted him as completely I trusted Barry, my first officer, who, like myself, was a native of Earth. Will you take over? Yes, I nodded, glancing at the twin charts beneath the ground glass top of the control table. Get what sleep you can for the next few Irnos. Presently I shall want every man on duty at his station. He glanced at me curiously, as the observer had done, but saluted and left with only a brief, Yes, sir. I returned the salute and turned my attention again to the charts. The navigating room of the interplanetary ship is without doubt unfamiliar ground to most, so it might be well for me to say that such ships have, for the most part, twin charts showing progress in two dimensions. To use land terms, lateral and vertical, these charts are really no more than large sheets of ground glass ruled in both directions with fine black lines, representing all relatively close heavenly bodies by green lights of varying sizes. The ship itself is represented by a red spark, and the whole is, of course, entirely automatic in action, the instruments comprising the chart being operated by the super-radio reflexes. Jaron, the chart showed me at a glance, was now far behind, and almost directly above, it is necessary to resort to these unscientific terms to make my meanings clear, was the tiny world of Elon, home of the friendly but impossibly dull winged people, the only ones in the known universe. I was there but once, and found them almost laughably like our common dragonflies on Earth, dragonflies that grow some seven feet long and with gauzy wings of amazing strength. Directly ahead on both charts was a brilliantly glowing sphere of green, our destination. I made some rapid mental calculations, studying the few fine black lines between the red spark that was our ship and the nearest edge of the great green sphere. I glanced at our speed indicator and then the attraction meter. The little red slide that moved around the rim of the attraction meter was squarely at the top, showing that the attraction was from straight ahead. The great black hand was nearly a third of the way around the face. We were very close. Two hours would bring us into the atmospheric envelope. In less than two hours and a half, we would be in the control city of what is now called the Forgotten Planet. I glanced forward through the thick glass partitions into the operating room. Three men stood there, watching intently. They, too, were wondering why we visited an unfriendly world. The planet itself loomed up straight ahead, a great half-circle, its curved rim sharp and bright against the empty blackness of space, the cord ragged and blurred. In two hours, I turned away and began a restless pacing. An hour went by, an hour and a half. I pressed the attention button to the operating room and gave orders to reduce our speed by half. 
we were very close to the outer fringe of the atmospheric envelope then keeping my eye on the big surface temperature gauge with its stubby red hand i resumed my nervous pacing slowly the thick red hand of the surface temperature gauge began to move slowly and then more rapidly until the eyes could catch its creeping reduced to atmospheric speed i ordered curtly and glanced down through a side port at one end of the long navigation room we were at the moment directly above the twilight belt to my right as i looked down i could see a portion of the glistening antarctic ice cap here and there were the great flat lakes almost seas of the planet our geographies of the universe today do not show the topography of the forgotten planet i might say therefore that the entire sphere was land area with numerous great lakes embedded in its surface together with many broad very crooked rivers as amy beove had reported there were no mountains and no high land altitude constant i ordered port three degrees stand by for further orders the earth seemed to whirl slowly beneath us great cities drifted astern and i compared the scene below me with the great maps i took from our chart case the control city should be just beyond the visible realm well in the daylight area port five degrees i said and pressed the attention button to barry's quarters mr barry please call all men to quarters including the off-duty watch and then report to the navigating room mr attell will be under my direct orders we shall descend within the next few minutes very well sir i pressed the attention button to attell's room mr attell please pick ten of your best men and have them report to the forward exit await me with the men at that place i shall be with you as soon as i turn the command over to mr barry we are descending immediately right sir said attell i turned from the microphone to find that barry had just entered the navigating room we will descend into the great court of the control city mr barry i said i have a mission here i'm sorry but these are the only instructions i can leave you i do not know how long i shall be gone from the ship but if i do not return within three hours depart without me and report directly to Colleen of the council to him and no other tell him verbally what took place should there be any concerted action against the tamon use your own judgment as to the action to be taken remembering that the safety of the ship and its crew and the report of the council are infinitely more important than my personal welfare is that clear yes sir too damned clear i smiled and shook my head don't worry i said lightly i'll be back well within the appointed time i hope so but there is something wrong as hell here i'm talking now as man to man not to my commanding officer i've been watching below and i have seen at least two spots where large numbers of our ships have been destroyed the remaining ships bear their own damned emblem where the crest of the alliance should be and was what does it mean it means i said slowly that i shall have to rely upon every man and officer to forget himself and myself and obey orders without hesitation and without flinching the orders are not mine but direct from the council itself i held out my hand to him an ancient earth gesture of greeting good will and farewell and he shook it vigorously god go with you he said softly and with a little nod of thanks i turned and quickly left the room etel with his ten men were waiting for me at the forward exit the men fell back a few paces and came to attention etel saluted smartly we are ready sir what are your orders you are to guard this opening under no circumstances is any one to enter save myself i shall be gone not longer than three hours if i am not back within that time mr barry has his orders the exit will be sealed and the tamon will depart immediately without me yes sir you will pardon me but i gather that your mission is a dangerous one may i not accompany you i shook my head i shall need you here but sir they are very excited and angry i have been watching them from the observation ports and there is a vast crowd of them around the ship i had expected that i thank you for your concern but i must go alone those are the orders will you unseal the exit 
His yes, sir, was brisk and efficient, but there was a worried frown on his features as he unlocked and released the switch that opened the exit. The huge plug of metal, some ten feet in diameter, revolved swiftly and noiselessly, backing slowly in its fine threads into the interior of the ship, gripped by the ponderous gimbals, which, as the last thread disengaged, swung the mighty disk to one side, like the door of some great safe. Remember your orders. I smiled, and with a little gesture to convey an assurance which I certainly did not feel, I strode through the circular opening, out into the crowd. The heavy glass secondary door shot down behind me, and I was in the hands of the enemy. The first thing I observed was that my manure, which I had picked up on my way to the exit, was not functioning. Not a person in all that vast multitude wore a manure. The five black-robed dignitaries who marched to meet me wore none. Nothing could have showed me more clearly that I was in trouble. To invite a visitor, as Colleen had done, to remove his manure first, was, of course, a polite and courteous thing to do if one wished to communicate by speech. To remove the manure before greeting a visitor wearing one was a tactic admission of rank enmity, a confession that one's thoughts were to be concealed. My first impulse was to snatch off my own instrument and fling it in the solemn, ugly faces of the nearest of the five dignitaries. I remembered Colleen's warning just in time. Quietly, I removed the metal circlet and tucked it under my arm, bowing slightly to the committee of five as I did so. "'I am Ja Ben,' said the first of the five, with an evil grin. "'You are the representative of the council that we commanded to appear?' I am John Hansen, commander of the ship Tamon of the Special Patrol Service. I am here to represent the Central Council, I replied with dignity. As we commanded, grinned Ja Ben. That is good. Follow us, and you shall have the evidence you were promised. Ja Ben led the way with two of his black-robed followers. The other two fell in behind me. A virtual prisoner... I marched between them through the vast crowd that made way grudgingly to let us pass. I have seen the people of most of the planets of the known universe. Many of them, to Earth notions, are odd. But these people, so much like us in many respects, were strangely repulsive. Their heads, as Amy Beove had recorded, were not round like ours, but possessed a high bony crest that ran from between their lashless, browless eyes down to the very nape of their necks. Their skin, even that covering their hairless heads, was a dull and papery white, like parchment, and their eyes were abnormally small and nearly round. A hateful, ugly people, perpetually scowling, snarling, their very voices resembled more the growl of wild beasts than the speech of intelligent beings. Ja Ben led the way straight to the low but vast building of dun-colored stone that I knew was the administration building of the control city. We marched up the broad, crowded steps through the muttering, jeering multitude into the building itself. The guards at the door stood aside to let us through, and the crowd at last was left behind. A swift, cylindrical elevator shot us upward into a great glass-walled laboratory, built like a sort of penthouse on the roof. Ja Ben walked quickly across the room towards the long, glass-topped table, and the other four closed in on me silently, but suggestively. "'That is unnecessary,' I said quietly. "'See, I am unarmed and completely in your power. I am here as an ambassador of the Central Council, not as a warrior.' "'Which is as well for you,' grinned Ja Ben. "'What I have to show you, you can see quickly, and then depart.' From a great cabinet in one corner of the room, he took a shining cylinder of dark red metal and held it up before him, stroking its sleek sides with an affectionate hand. "'Here it is,' he said, chuckling. "'The secret of our power, in here, safely imprisoned now, but capable of being released at our command.' is death for every living thing upon any planet we choose to destroy. He replaced the great cylinder in the cabinet and picked up in its stead a tiny vial of the same metal, no larger than my little finger and not so long. Here, he said, turning again towards me, is the means of proving our power to you. Come closer. 
With my bodyguard of four watching every move, I approached. Ja Ben selected a large hollow hemisphere of crystal glass and placed it upon a smooth sheet of flat glass. Next, he picked a few blossoms from a bowl that stood incredulously enough on the table and threw them under the glass hemisphere. Flora, he grinned. Hurrying to the other end of the room, he reached into a large flat metal cage and brought forth three small rodent-like animals, natives of that world. These he also tossed carelessly under the glass. Fauna, he grunted, and picked up the tiny metal vial. One end of the vial unscrewed, he turned the cap gently, carefully, a strained, anxious look upon his face. My four guards watched him breathlessly, fearfully. The cap came loose at last, disclosing the end of the tube, sealed with the grayish substance that looked like wax. Very quickly, Ja Ben rolled the little cylinder under the glass hemisphere and picked up a beaker that had begun bubbling gently on an electric plate close by. Swiftly, he poured the thick contents of the beaker around the base of the glass bell. The stuff hardened almost instantly, forming an airtight seal between the glass hemisphere and the flat plate of glass upon which it rested. Then, with an evil, triumphant smile, Ja Ben looked up. Flora, he repeated, fauna, and death. Watch! The little metal cylinder is plugged still, but in a moment, that plug will disappear. Simply a volatile solid, you understand. It is going rapidly. Rapidly. It is almost gone now. Watch. In an instant now. Ah! I saw the gray substance that stopped the entrance of the little metal vial disappear. The rodents ran around and over it, trying to find a crevice by which they might escape. The flowers, bright and beautiful, lay untidily on the bottom of the glass prison. Then, just as the last vestige of the gray plug vanished, an amazing, a terrible thing happened. At the mouth of the tiny metal vial, a greenish cloud appeared. I call it a cloud, but it was not that. It was solid, and it spread in every direction, sending out little needles that lashed about and ran together into solid mass, while millions of little needles reached out swiftly. One of these little needles touched a scurrying animal. Instantly, the tiny brute stiffened, and from his entire body, the greenish needles spread swiftly. One of the flowers turned suddenly thick and pulpy with the soft green mass. Then another, another of the rodents, God! In the space of two heartbeats, the entire hemisphere was filled with the green mass that still moved and writhed and seemed to press against the glass sides as though the urge to expand was insistent, imperative. What is it? I whispered, still staring at the thing. Death, grunted Ja Ben, thrusting his hateful face close to mine, his tiny round eyes with their lashless lids glinting. Death, my friend. Go and tell your great council of this death that we have created for every planet that will not obey us. We have gone back into the history of dealing death and have come back with a death such as the universe has never known before. There is a rapacious, deadly fungus we have been two centuries in developing. The spores contained in that tiny metal tube would be invisible to the naked eye. And yet, given but a little time to grow, with air and vegetation and flesh to feed upon, and even that small capsule would wipe out a world. And in the cabinet, he pointed, grinning triumphantly, we have ready for instant use enough of the spores of this deadly fungus to wipe out all the worlds of your great alliance. To wipe them out utterly, he repeated, his voice shaking with a sort of frenzy now. Every living thing upon their faces, wrapped in that thin, hungry green stuff you see there under that glass. All life wiped out, made uninhabitable so long as the universe shall endure. And we, we shall be rulers, unquestioned, of that universe. Tell your doddering council that. He leaned back against the table, panting with hate. I shall tell them all I have seen, all you have said, I nodded. You believe we have the power to do this? I do. 
God help me and the universe, I said solemnly. There was no doubt in my mind. I could see all too clearly how well their plans had been laid, how quickly this hellish growth would strangle all life once its spores began to develop. The only possible chance was to get back to the Council and make my report with all possible speed so that every available armed ship of the universe might concentrate here and wipe out these people before they had time to— I know what you're thinking, my friend, broke in Ja Ben mockingly. You might as well have warned the Manor. You would have the ships of the Alliance destroy us before we have time to act. We had foreseen that and have provided for the possibility. As soon as you leave here, ships, provided with many tubes like the one just used for our little demonstration, will be dispersed in every direction. We shall be in constant communication with those ships, and at the least sign of hostility, they will be ordered to depart and spread their death upon every world they can reach. Some of them you may be able to locate and eliminate, a number of them are certain to elude capture in infinite space, and if only one, one lone ship should escape, the doom of the Alliance, in millions upon millions of people, will be pronounced. I warn you, it will be better, much better, to bow to our wishes and pay us the tribute we shall demand. Any attempt at resistance will precipitate certain disaster for your council and all the worlds the Council governs. At least we would wipe you out first, I said hoarsely. True, nodded Jabin. But the vengeance of our ships would be a terrible thing. You would not dare to take the chance. I stood there, staring at him in a sort of daze. What he had said was so true, terribly, damnably true. If only... There was but one chance I could see and desperate as it was, I took it. Whirling the heavy metal ring of my manure in hand, I sprang towards the table. If I could break the sealed glass hemisphere and loose the fungus upon its creators, deal to them the doom they had planned for the universe, then, perhaps, all might yet be well. Ja Ben understood instantly what was in my mind. He and his four aides leaped between me and the table, their tiny round eyes blazing with anger. I struck one of the four viciously with the manure, and with a gasp he fell back and slumped to the floor. Before I could break through the opening, however, Ja Ben struck me full in the face with his mighty fist, a blow that sent me dazed and reeling into a corner of the room. I brought up with a crash against the cabinet there, groped wildly in an effort to steady myself, and fell to the floor. Almost before I struck, all four of them were upon me. They hammered me viciously, shouted at me, cursed me in the universal tongue, but I paid no heed. I pretended to be unconscious, but my heart was beating high with sudden, glorious hope, and in my brain a terrible, merciless plan was forming. When I had groped against the cabinet in an effort to regain my balance, my fingers had closed upon one of the little metal vials. As I fell, I covered that hand with my body and hastily hid the tiny tube in a deep pocket of my blue and silver service uniform. Slowly, after a few seconds, I opened my eyes and looked up at them, helplessly. "'Go now!' snarled Ja Ben, dragging me to my feet. "'Go and tell your council we are more than a match for you and for them!' He thrust me, reeling towards his three assistants. Take him to his ship, and send aid for Eif Rance here. He glanced at the still unconscious figure of the victim of my manure, and then turned to me with a last warning. Remember, one thing more, my friend. You have disintegrator ray equipment on your ship. You have the little atomic bombs that won for the Alliance the Second War of the Planets. I know that, but if you make the slightest effort to use them... I shall dispatch my supply of the Green Death to our ships, and they will depart upon their missions at once. You would take upon yourself a terrible responsibility by making the smallest hostile move. Go now, and when you return, bring with you members of your great council, who will have the power to hear our demands and see that they are obeyed. And do not keep us waiting over long, for we are an impatient race." He bowed, mockingly, 
and passed his left hand swiftly before his face, his people's sign of parting. I nodded, not trusting myself to speak, and hemmed in by the three black-robed conductors, was hurried down the elevator and back through the jeering mob to my ship. The glass secondary door shot up to permit me to enter, and Attell grabbed my shoulder anxiously, his eyes smoldering angrily. "'Are you hurt, sir?' he said in his odd, high-pitched voice, staring into my bruised face. "'What? It's nothing,' I assured him. "'Close the exit immediately. We depart at once.' "'Yes, sir.' He closed the switch, and the great threaded plug swung gently on its gimbals and began to revolve, swiftly and silently. A little bell sounded sharply, and the great door ceased its motion. Attell locked the switch and returned the key to his pocket. Good. All men are at their stations? Yes, sir. Except these ten, detailed to guard the exit. Have them report to their regular stations. Issue orders to the ray operators that they are to instantly, and without further orders, destroy any ship that may leave the surface of this planet. Have every atomic bomb crew ready for an instant and concentrated offensive directed at the control city, but command them do not act under any circumstances unless I give the order. Is that clear, Mr. Attell? Yes, sir. I nodded and turned away, making my way immediately to the navigating room. Mr. Barry, I said quickly and gravely, I believe that the fate of the known universe depends upon us at this moment. We will ascend vertically at once, slowly, until we are just outside the envelope, maintaining only sufficient horizontal motion to keep us directly over the control city. Will you give the necessary orders? Immediately, sir. He pressed the attention button to the operating room and spoke swiftly into the microphone. Before he completed the order, I had left. We were already ascending when I reached the port forward atomic bomb station. The man in charge, a Zinian, saluted with automatic precision and awaited orders. You have a bomb in readiness? I asked, returning the salute. Those are my orders, sir. Correct. Remove it, please. I waited impatiently while the crew removed the bomb from the releasing strap. It was withdrawn at last a fish-shaped affair, very much like the ancient airplane bombs, save that it was no larger than my two fists, placed one upon the other, and that it had four silvery wires running along its side, from rounded nose to pointed tail, held at a distance from the body by a series of insulating struts. Now, I said quickly, how quickly can you put another object in the trap, reseal the opening, and release the object? While the commander counts ten with reasonable speed, said the Zinian with pride, we won first honors in the Special Patrol Service Contest at the last examination. The commander may remember. I do remember. That is why I selected you for this duty. With hands that trembled a little, I think, I drew forth the little vial of gleaming red metal while the bomb crew watched me curiously. I shall unscrew the cap from this little vial, I explained, and drop it immediately into the releasing trap, reseal the trap, and release this object as quickly as it is possible to do so. If you can better the time you made to win the honors at examination, in God's name do so. Yes, sir, replied the Zinian. He gave brisk orders to his crew, and each of the three men sprang alertly into position. As quickly as I could, I turned off the cap of the little metal vial and dropped it into the trap. The heavy plug, a tiny duplicate of the exit door, clicked shut upon it and spun whining gently into the opening. Something clicked sharply, and one of the crew dropped a bar into place. As it shot home, the Zinian in command of the crew pulled the release plunger. "'Done, sir,' he said proudly. I did not reply, my eye fixed upon the observation tube that was following the tiny missile to the ground. The control city was directly below us. I lost sight of the vial almost instantly, but the indicating crosshairs showed me exactly where the vial would strike at a point approximately halfway between the edge of the city and the great squat pile of the administrating building with its gleaming glass penthouse, the laboratory in which only a few minutes before I had witnessed the demonstration of the death which awaited the universe. Excellent! I exclaimed. Smartly done, men. I turned and hurried to the navigating room where the most powerful of our television discs was located. The disc was not as perfect as those we have today. 
It was hooded to keep out exterior light, which is not necessary with the later instruments, and it was more unwieldy. However, it did its work, and did it well in the hands of an experienced operator. With only a nod to Barry, I turned the range band to maximum and brought it swiftly to bear upon that portion of the city in which the little vial had fallen. As I drew the focusing lever towards me, the scene leaped at me through the clear, glowing glass disk. Froth! Green, billowing froth that grew and boiled and spread unceasingly, in places it reached high into the air, and it moved with an eager inner life that was somehow terrible and revolting. I moved the range hand back, and the view seemed to drop away from me swiftly. I could see the whole city now. All one side of it was covered with the spreading green stain that moved and flowed so swiftly. Thousands of tiny black figures were running in the streets, crowding away from the awful danger that menaced them. The green patch spread more swiftly always. When I had first seen it, the edges were advancing as rapidly as a man could run. Now they were fairly racing, and the speed grew constantly. A ship, two of them, three of them came darting from somewhere else towards the administration building with its glass cupola. I held my breath as the deep, sudden humming from the Taman told me that our rays were busy. Would they... One of the enemy ships disappeared suddenly in a little cloud of dirty, heavy dust that settled swiftly. Another, and a third. Three little streaks of dust, falling, falling. A fourth ship and a fifth ship came rushing up, their sides faintly glowing from the speed they had made. The green flood, thick and insistent, was racing up and over the administration building now. It reached the roof, ran swiftly. The fourth ship shattered into dust. The fifth settled swiftly, and then that ship also disappeared, together with the corner of the building. Then the thick green stuff flowed over the whole building, and there was nothing to be seen there but a mound of soft, flowing, gray-green stuff that rushed on now with the swiftness of the wind. I looked up into Barry's face. "'You're ill,' he said quickly. "'Is there anything I can do, sir?' "'Yes,' I said, forming the words with difficulty. "'Give orders to ascend at emergency speed.' For once, my first officer hesitated. He glanced at the attraction meter and then turned to me again, wondering. "'At this height, sir, emergency speed will mean dangerous heating of the surface.' Perhaps I want it white hot, Mr. Barry. She is built to stand it. Emergency speed, please, immediately. Right, sir, he said briskly, and gave the order. I felt my weight increase as the order was obeyed. Gradually, the familiar, uncomfortable feeling left me. Silently, Barry and I watched the big surface temperature gauge as it started to move. The heat inside became uncomfortable, grew intense. The sweat poured from us. In the operating room forward, I could see the men casting quick, wondrous glances up at us through the heavy glass partition that lay between. The thick, stubby red hand of the surface temperature gauge moved slowly, but steadily towards the heavy red line that marked the temperature at which the outer shell of our hull would become incandescent. The hand was within three or four degrees of that mark when I gave Barry the order to arrest our motion. When he had given the order, I turned to him and motioned towards the television disc. Look, I said. He looked, and when at last he tore his face away from the hood, he seemed ten years older. What is it? he asked in a choked whisper. Why, they're being wiped out, the whole of that world. True, and some of the seeds of that terrible death might have drifted upward and found a lodging place upon the surface of our ship. That is why I ordered the emergency speed, while we were still within the atmospheric envelope, Barry, to burn away that contamination, if it existed. Now we're safe, unless... I pressed the attention button to the station of the chief of the ray operators. Your report, I ordered. Nine ships disintegrated, sir, he replied instantly. Five before the city was destroyed, four later. You are certain that none escaped? Positive, sir. Very good. I turned to Barry, smiling. Point her nose for Zinnia, Mr. Barry, I said. As soon as it is feasible, resume emergency speed. There are some very anxious gentlemen there awaiting our report, and I dare not convey it except in person. 
Yes, sir, Barry said, crisply. This, then, is the history of the Forgotten Planet. On the charts of the universe, it appears as an unnamed world. No ship is permitted to pass close enough to it so that its attraction is greater than that of the nearest other mass. A permanent outpost of fixed station ships, with headquarters upon Jaron, the closest world, is maintained by the Council. There are millions of people who might be greatly disturbed if they knew of this potential menace that lurks in the midst of our universe. But they do not know. The wisdom of the Council made certain of that. But, in order that in the ages to come there might be a record of this matter, I have been asked to prepare this document for the sealed archives of the Alliance. It has been a pleasant task. I have relived, for a little time, a part of my youth. The work is done now, and that is well. I am an old man, and weary. Sometimes I wish I might live to see the wonders that the next generation or so will witness. But my years are heavy upon me. My work is done. End of The Forgotten Planet by Sewell Peasley Wright Where the f f pebbles go, by Miriam Allen DeFord. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for LibriVox by Clatu at mixedsignals.ml/cnc. Where the f f f pebbles go, by Miriam Allen DeFord. Gral and Hadnuth were playing f f f in case you were not a f and haven't ever seen Blitten's classic Ways of Improving Your f -f Game, its essence consists in lobbing pebbles at a target as near the horizon as your skill permits. After each throw, you fly over to see how far you went. It sounds like a simple game, but it has complicated restrictions and rules, and a good f, -f, -f player can command any amount of heavy service from the spectators. Since a lot of the ground dwellers are also f -f they could never become players, of course, being far too small and light to handle the f -f -f pebbles. This means that a real champion never has to do any kind of work again, being fed, clothed, housed, and entertained by his admirers, and can devote all his time to the game. Gral and Hadnuth, having alternated as champions for many a long ganath, had it pretty easy, but neither of them was given to lying back on his laurels and growing soft. This meant that when a match was announced, ground dwellers as well as we real people came by the Hanthoids from Ziggles around to watch through viewing tubes, and whichever of the two won piled up a lot of billibs of voluntary service. Voluntary service, as most economists admit, is true wealth, since the pledge is incumbent on the offerer's heirs until it is fully satisfied, and can likewise be willed by the recipient to his heirs. Naturally, no pf -pf player is absolutely perfect. If he were, there would be no contest, and nobody would bother to attend the game. Pebbles fall short, they go awry, and sometimes they are thrown so hard that they escape altogether from our light gravity and fly into outer space. At the end of the game period, the referee, usually a superannuated former champion, totes up the score and announces how many times each player missed the target and by which of these errors he missed it. By a rather confusing arithmetical computation, he then determines which of them won, and the winner collects his pledges, and the fans collect the side bets they have been making all through the game. In this particular game, Hodnuth won, but then he won about half the time, so that wasn't what gave it its importance. The ground dwellers, as everyone knows, are an excitable and volatile race, which is why we conquered them so easily, with the added advantage of our command of levitation and our immensely greater size and strength. So just an ordinary f, -f game often looks like a riot. When anything out of the way occurs, such as the appearance of a new young contender to take on one of the champions, the ground dwellers simply go wild. And this time they practically exploded. I confess that even we real people were amazed. One of the thinkers was discovered attending the game. Now, when we first arrived here and cleaned up the ground dwellers and established them in their proper subservient position, the thinkers were our leaders. It was they who had figured out the whole invasion, had headed the sixty Hastgunt flight, and had worked out the tactics and logistics of the great conquest. But once we were settled and things were going smoothly, they called a last general meeting and told us that their part was finished, and that now they were going to retire to the far colony and go on with their thinking. 
Since then, if a problem arises that our own council can't handle, one of us has to fly to the far colony and obtain the advice of a thinker. They live together there with their families, supported, of course, by all of us, and spend all their time in study and research. It is one of the natural advantages of us real people that we have these specialized thinkers to do all our intellectual and cultural tasks, and teach us what we need to know, leaving us others free for the truly satisfying functions of government and commerce. Never in all the Ganaths since that last general meeting had a thinker been seen among us, and that so august a being should condescend to attend a mere pfft game was unbelievable. Yet there he was, easily recognizable, naturally, since all thinkers have long white hair and long white beards, even the female thinkers, though some heretics say their beards are artificial. In fact, that is the way one knows that a new thinker has been born. Soon after birth his hair and beard begin to grow, both white, and as soon as he is weaned we fly him to the far colony to be reared and educated by his own. If a thinker has a child who isn't one, they send him back to us. As soon as the spectators realized that a thinker was among us, the excitement reached boiling point. The ground-dwellers almost went crazy, for, of all things, the thinker had seated himself not in the perches of honor of the real people, in front, but in the ground-dwellers' bleachers. We ourselves noticed all the scrambling and heaving, and when some of us flew over to investigate we could hardly believe our eyes. When I say scrambling and heaving, I don't mean they were mobbing him. They're much too afraid of us for that. And anyway, their reverence for the thinkers is positively religious, much more so than ours. After all, the thinkers are simply specialized members of our own race, and though we revere them, we could scarcely worship them, as the ground-dwellers do. No, they were clearing a respectful space all around him. But then they kept gazing at him in awe, half of them falling on their knees in his presence. I sneaked a glance at the f, -f players, and as I suspected, they were looking anything but happy. Champions are pretty vain. They don't care for rival attractions. One of our party, it was Sephar, who, as usual, pushed himself forward, bowed to the thinker, and asked if he wouldn't be more comfortable among us. But he shook his white beard and said no, he could see better where he was. I wonder if thinkers may not have a bit of vanity, too, and if he wasn't enjoying seeing all those poor creatures prostrate themselves around him. Then will your honor join us when the game is over, persisted Sephar. If you would enter my poor pit of a dwelling, it would overwhelm me with pleasure to have you feast with us. His poor pit of dwelling, indeed. I wish you could see the palace he lived in. The roof opening is plated with solid nag. I was just about bursting with indignation, but I should have known you can trust a thinker to deflate a fellow like that. Thank you, brother, he said mildly. But I'm here doing some research, and I'll have to fly back right after the game. Sephar opened his mouth to argue, but by that time I had him by the wing, and I pulled him back. He said rudely, I say firmly, Do you want to give us a bad name for presumption, brother? I whispered, Don't interfere with a thinker when he's thinking. Some of the rest of us nodded agreement, so Sephar shut up. But he had a nasty gleam in his eye, and I braced myself for trouble later. We bowed and returned to our places. Thanks to Sephar and his performance, I missed the last throw Growl made, which lost him the contest. But I heard the moan from the spectators who weren't watching the thinker instead, so I knew he'd lobbed a too high one. It must have been a humdinger, one of the throws into space. I glanced back as I was flying away, and the thinker was standing up and gazing intently after it. Well, I thought to myself, imagine a thinker getting worked up over a pfft throw. The game was over soon after that, and Hodnuth went around collecting his pledges while Grawl was being consoled by his backers. When I got a chance to look again where the thinker had been sitting, he had disappeared. The one who hadn't disappeared was Sephar. He was waiting for me, just as I'd expected. Not here, I snarled at him. Do you want the ground dwellers to see real people in a brawl? So we adjourned to Marnag's courtyard, which was the nearest dueling place, and it was a nice little fight, and I won. Quite a group gathered around, and I was pleased to see that several of my friends were making bets on me. Some of Sephar's sycophants lugged him off to the hospital to have a fractured wingtip treated. The rest came home with me, and we spent our winnings on a good dinner with plenty of mastonye to wash it down. Several of us speculated about the thinker, and we wondered if his research wasn't a fake, and if he just decided to enjoy a game like the rest of us. After all, Marnag pointed out, he might be only a boy. You can't tell with a thinker. I suppose young thinkers can be frivolous and rebellious like our own youngsters. Nipar, who is something of a wag, yelled, 
Hey, listen to Marnag. He's thinking. Come on, Marnag. Are you really a thinker in disguise? Let's see if that green hair of yours has died. You could have shaved the beard, and he poured a pitcher of Mastanyi right over Marnag's head to find out if the color would come off. After that, the party got really rough, and I don't remember the rest of it. A whole ganath after that, the thinkers sent one of their messengers to tell us in the council that we were summoned to a meeting in the far colony. That doesn't happen often, so we knew something extremely important must be up. I, for one, was all of a twitter. Not one of us connected the summons with that thinker who had come to the pf -pf contest between Gral and Hodnuth. That was our stupidity. We should have guessed it when we found the two champions had been sent for also. Gral flew next to me on the trip, and of all things, both he and Hodnuth were carrying with them several pf -pf pebbles which the thinkers had ordered them to bring along. It's hard to tell the thinkers apart, at least for us who aren't thinkers, but I recognized the one who had been at the game. He sat right by Hledo, who always acts as their spokesman when we consult them about anything. Welcome and thank you for coming so promptly, Hledo began. Did you two f -f players bring the pebbles? Grawl and Hodnuth handed over the load, and Hledo passed it on to the one we knew. This is Mirawan, Hledo said, and he will tell you the urgent thing he has thought. I became interested a long time ago, Mirawan began in a rather rusty voice, all the thinkers except Hledo have. They spend most of their time in study and meditation, and don't talk much among themselves. In a question that seems never to have occurred to any of us. Where do f -f pebbles go when they are thrown beyond our feeble gravity and escape into outer space? What becomes of them in the end? And who, if anyone, collects them? And what conclusions about them, and our world, do such persons draw? I raised my hand to ask a question, and Mirawan nodded. I don't understand, I said politely, meaning he was being too abstruse for any of us, for it is understood that there is no keener apprehension in the Council than my own. Is your honor implying that there exist outside our world other intelligences that would be capable of observing and drawing conclusions from the pebbles? Exactly. I know that the general belief is that it is impossible that extraplanetary beings can exist, least of all intelligent beings. That was the belief of my own colleagues until I gave them the results of my recent thought. It is the reason we have summoned you here. For some time now, we have been receiving peculiar radio waves from outside the world. We have considered them merely manifestations of random radiation from other planets and stars, but now they have suddenly become, shall I say, rhythmical, measured, directional. They leave the impression that someone or something is trying to communicate with us. The astronomers among us have become more and more concerned. We have finally been led to the reluctant belief that our former theories have been wrong, that this actually is not the only inhabited planet. Now I need not tell you how disastrous it would be for us if that were true, if there are intelligent beings on other planets, if they are trying to communicate with us, then the next step would be that they would try to visit us. Marnag raised his hand. What harm would that do? If such beings exist, and if they could come here, why wouldn't we go there, too, wherever it is? And wouldn't that enrich our lives? Of course, I'm not a thinker. I had a fleeting vision of Nipar and the pitcher of Mastanyi. But I'm a real man and I can see no reason why it would hurt us to find we are not alone in the universe. No, said Mirawan dryly. You are not a thinker, my friend. We enjoy here a completely stable civilization. It is the best of all possible social systems. We do not want it disturbed. I see, said Marnag, and several others nodded. I confess that a heretical idea crossed my mind, that any such disturbance might well dethrone the thinkers first of all but I suppressed it. Mirawan went on. And that is where the pf -pf pebbles come in. In the course of my research on these previously unknown waves, I began to wonder what, if anything, had initiated the interest of outsiders in our planet, assuming that outsiders exist. Certainly we had made no move toward trying either to reach or to communicate with any putative dwellers on other planets. There had been no major changes on our planet that could have enlisted the attention of outside astronomers, even granting that they have telescopes as powerful as our own. 
only one thing, so far as I can ascertain, has ever left this planet for outer space. And that was the pebbles. We call them pebbles. To beings who might consider us giants, and if there really are intelligent beings in other worlds, they might well be of an entirely different size from us, though no less dangerous for all that, they might seem huge meteors. Suppose that, though most of them would undoubtedly burn up, and all of them be considerably reduced before they struck another planet as meteorites, some of them at least might still be sufficiently large to be analyzed chemically, and suppose that, where they struck, there existed beings capable of analyzing them. This was getting a little deep for anybody not a thinker to take in. Several council members raised their hands plaintively, and so indicated. All right, I'll try to make it plainer, Mirwan said. Let us pretend that instead of the little fragments of space debris that fall harmlessly in the annual meteor showers here, we were pelted with enormous chunks of matter, perhaps causing major damage to property and life. Wouldn't we immediately undertake an intensive study to determine whence they came, and of what precisely they consisted? And if we found that these residual meteorites contained material indicating their origin in an inhabited world, still worse, in a world sufficiently evolved to entail the possibility or probability that its highest life forms might be intelligent, or even civilized, wouldn't we take steps at once to investigate? Moreover, wouldn't we be outraged to the point where our primary object would be to avenge ourselves? Of course we would, and so, of course, would any beings of other planets under similar circumstances. You mean, Marnag asked, that if beings came here from space, they would attack us? That, too, but even if that were not their reaction, curiosity alone could be enough to spur them on to exploration. But, but what can we do? quavered old Gantes. He is really growing too senile to be on the council much longer. We can discourage them, and we can mislead them. How? We can make certain that nothing reaches them in the future, which gives them the least sign that any but the lowest forms of life, if even those, exist in our world. I studied this whole question systematically, as we always do. I came to the conclusion that only the pf -pf pebbles could possibly betray us. I attended a pf -pf game to see for myself if a pebble actually could be thrown with sufficient force to become, as it were, an artificial meteor. I found that it could, indeed. I saw Growl make such a throw. Growl looked stricken. He fell flat on his face, groveling before the thinkers. Oh, your reverences, he cried. I never dreamt, I never— Get up, Growl, Mirowan ordered. Nobody's blaming you. Nobody expects anyone but a thinker to think. We'll make it a rule from now on to hold our shots. We'll bar anyone from the game forever who lobs a pebble too hard, Hodneth promised fervently. Far from it, said Mirowan. On the contrary, in the future you must concentrate on supra-gravity shots. Give extra points to anyone who performs one. Why? Several of us murmured, completely bewildered. Because I have already analyzed three pebbles I brought back with me from the game. With the ones you have brought, I shall be able to make further tests. If they confirm my previous findings, I think we shall be able to mislead any potential attackers. Every f, -f, f pebble henceforth will be doctored. To use any unauthorized pebble will become a felony. What has happened in the past we can't change, but there may still be time to save ourselves. From this time forth, there are going to be more meteors shot off our atmosphere than ever before, and every one of them is going to tell a completely false story about conditions in their place of origin. Of course, we may be entirely wrong. These new waves may be due to purely physical causes. Other planets may all be as devoid of intelligent life as we have always assumed. But if there is the faintest possibility, and I feel there is, that we are in danger, it would be fatal not to take such measures as we can to avert it. What's in the pebbles now that could tell anything about us? Growl asked. And if something is, how could you alter it? Mirwan froze up a little. The thinkers don't like to have us ask detailed questions. But he realized that Graal was still upset and answered kindly. It wouldn't mean a lot to you if I told you, but you can understand this much. Chemical analysis of the pebbles I've looked at so far shows fragments of embedded fossils. 
Of plants, you mean? Miron smiled. Plants don't become fossilized, he said. In one pebble there was a microscopic piece of a metal knife. In another there was half a fossilized tooth. Ground-dweller relics, true, but human. You must remember that all the hills around here from which you gather the pebbles are really million ganath old burial places of the ground-dwellers. We haven't bothered to dig up most of them because we're so rich in prehistoric remains with our immensely old civilization that we have all the fossils and ancient artifacts we need. But let's imagine an alien civilization, a great deal younger than ours. Let's imagine that in even one of these pebbles, which would be a meteorite to them, even a minute trace of that kind of thing should be left. What would they think? For they would have to have thinkers, too, to be civilized at all. I'll tell you what they'd think. They'd decide that somewhere out in space there is a rich, undiscovered planet, full of valuable knowledge and, even better, valuable artifacts. Probably a world with a culture much more advanced than their own, and they'd try hard to trace the direction from which those meteorites came and to calculate the distance. Then suppose they had some means of transportation in space. That may well be what these new radio waves mean. They may be attempts at communication, if we were foolish enough to respond to them. We don't dare to take any chances. So from now on there are going to be swarms and swarms of those meteoroids, and every one of them is going to be a real artifact on its own, a manufactured one, made according to our specifications, carrying an unmistakable message, a false one. They will be cunningly constructed from forms of matter injurious to any conceivable variety of life. We'll cover them all, and they'll be barren of even the most primitive bacteria. They will carry in themselves a silent warning. Approach the planet from which these come at peril of your instant death, no matter what kind of being you are. That should save us forever. I'd been wondering why Sephar had kept his big mouth shut all this time. To my way of feeling, he should never have been with us at all. He would never have been a council member if he hadn't been a multi billet bear. But I'd won a fair fight with him, and officially we had to be friends, so I hadn't protested when I found he was included in the summons. But now the big blowhard had to put his two grocks worth. Your reverence, your honor, he spluttered. May I ask a question? Certainly, brother. Since players have been lobbing pebbles out into space for thousands and thousands of ganaths, and as your honor says, some of them must long ago have landed somewhere, who knows what dead giveaways may have been in any of them? Is that your question? No, I have two. First, why haven't these intelligent beings whose existence you're presupposing— I saw Merwin's face set, and I knew he'd noted that rude and insulting word, but I managed to conceal my smile— why haven't they come here before this? And since they haven't come, if they're smart enough to figure out our whereabouts, why aren't they also smart enough to realize the difference between the old pebbles and these new ones, and to know that we're putting something over on them? We sometimes say that though the thinkers are, of course, overwhelmingly our superiors mentally, they lack the emotional control, which is the great characteristic of the rest of us real people. I wish those scandal mongers could have seen Mirawan then. His face was as white as his beard and his wings quivered, but he let Sephar have his say out, and he answered him very quietly. As to your first question, brother, and if anybody ever called me brother in that tone, I'd know it was a case of fight or run. The only logical reason is that it must be only recently that such beings have reached a state of culture where they are able to analyze the pebbles and draw the right conclusions from them. And the answer to your second question is that we can only hope. Hope that all of the pebbles already in their possession are free of, shall we say, incriminating evidence. All we can guarantee is that all they find in the future will be. Does that answer you satisfactorily? It will have to, muttered Sephar sullenly. I moved away from him and was glad to notice that I was not the only one. What I have said to you, continued the thinker calmly, you may communicate to any of the real people you wish. You will naturally keep it from the ground dwellers, there is no reason to agitate them at present. Time enough for that if we should ever need them as soldiers, which I devoutly hope we never shall. But who will make the artificial pebbles if the ground dwellers aren't to know about them? asked Marnag. 
But what about our slogan, thought from the thinkers, government and administration from the real people, technical skill and heavy labor from the ground dwellers? We shall handle that. When you go home, tell Irnig I want to see him at once. Brief him first. He and his bureau will see that the job is done, and the ground dwellers needn't be told just what they are making. They'll be delighted to hear that we are planning a new kind of f-f pebble to increase the interest of the game. They love it whenever one is batted clear away. Well, all this was last Ganaf. The new pebbles are in use. So far, nothing has happened, unless you count the fact that, according to Mirawan, those peculiar radio waves have ceased. Let us hope that if his whole theory is correct, and, and thinkers don't talk about their thoughts till they're pretty sure of them, those alien beings have given up, decided either that they were mistaken, and there is no intelligence here able to communicate, or that they themselves haven't the ability to interpret our answers. Sephar? Oh, he isn't around anymore. One of the thinkers is doing some experiments in psychological adjustment. Cleto asked the Council's recommendation of somebody they could commandeer as a test subject, according to the agreement on thinkers' privileges, and I got them to suggest Sephar. He was very nasty about it, but I ignored his underbred invective. I felt it my duty also respectfully to remind Cleto of Sephar's past indiscretions, in case they'd forgotten. Usually when the thinkers have finished with a subject, he's no longer of much use and they put him in a rest home for the remainder of his life. So since I've done pretty well for myself lately, I was able to buy Sephar's home, with its nog-plated roof opening, and move into it. He had a very attractive wife, who, of course, couldn't go with him to the far colony. It just goes to show that virtue, as one of the thinkers once remarked wittily, is its own reward. End of Where Do the pf pf Pebbles Go? by Miriam Allen DeFord Recording by Klaatu at mixedsignals.ml slash cnc One Way by Miriam Allen DeFord This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for LibriVox by Klaatu at mixedsignals.ml slash cnc One Way by Miriam Allen DeFord we had the driver let us off in the central district, and took a copter taxi back to Homefield. There's no disgrace about it, of course, we just didn't feel like having all the neighbors see the big sky car with Lydna Project painted on its side, and then having them drop in casually to express what they would call interest, and we would know to be curiosity. There are people who boast that their sons and daughters have been picked for Lydna. What is there to boast about? It's pure chance, within limits. And how is our only child? And we love him. Lucy didn't say a word all the way back from saying goodbye to him. Lucy and I have been married now for twenty-seven years, and I guess I know her about as well as anybody on earth does. People who don't know her so well think she's cold. But I knew what feelings she was crushing down inside her. Besides, I wasn't feeling much like talking myself. I was remembering too many things. Hal, at about two, looking up at me, when I would come home dead tired from a hard day of being chewed at by half a dozen bosses right up to the editor-in-chief whenever anything went the least bit out of kilter, with a smile that made all my tiredness disappear. Hal, when I'd pick him up at school, proudly displaying a cybernetics approval slip and ignoring the fact that half the other kids had one too. Hal, the day I took him to the beard removal center, certain that he was a man now that he was old enough for depilation. Hal, that morning two weeks ago, setting out to get his vocational assignment certificate. And that's when I stopped remembering. It had been five years after our marriage before they let us start a child. Some question about Lucy's uncle and my grandmother. Most parents aren't as old as we are when they get the news, and usually have other children left. So it isn't so bad. When we got home, Lucy still was silent. She took off her scarf and cloak and put them away, and then she pushed the button for dinner without even asking me what I wanted. I noticed, though, that she was ordering all the things I like. We both had the day off, of course, to go and say goodbye to Hal. Lucy is a technician at a hydroponics center. I felt awkward and clumsy. Her ways are so different from mine. I explode, and then it's over, just a sore place where it hurts if I touch it. Lucy never explodes, but I knew the sore place would be there forever, and getting worse instead of better. We ate dinner in silence, 
though neither of us felt hungry and had the table cleared. Then it was nearly nineteen o'clock, and I had to speak. The takeoff will be at nineteen ten, I said. Want me to tune in now? Last year, when Mutro was solar president, he gave a good speech before the kids left. Don't turn it on at all, she said sharply. Then, in a softer voice, she added, Of course, Frank. Turn it on whenever you like. I'll just go up to my room and open the soundproofing. There were still no tears in her eyes. I thought of a thousand things to say. Don't you want to catch a glimpse of Hal and the crowd going up the ramp? Mightn't they let the kids wave a last farewell to their folks listening and watching in? Mightn't something in the President's speech make us feel a little better? But I heard myself saying, Never mind, Lucy. Don't go. I'll leave the thing off. I didn't want to be alone. I wanted Lucy there with me. So we sat out the whole time of the VisiCast, side by side on the window couch, holding hands. I'll say this for the neighbors. They must all have known, for Hal was the first to be selected from Homefield in nearly forty years, and the newscast must have announced it over and over, but not a single person on the whole sixty-two floors of the house butted in on us. Not even that snoopy student from Venus in 47 TAC 14, who's always dropping in on other tenants and taking notes on the mores of Earth aboriginals. People can be very decent sometimes. We needn't have worried about coming home in the Lydna Project bus. It was no good trying to keep my mind on anything else. Whether I wanted to or not, the last two hours we'd ever have with Hal. It couldn't mean to him what it meant to us. We were losing. He was both losing and gaining. We were losing our whole lives for twenty-one years past. He was too, but he was entering a new life we would never know anything about. No word ever comes from Lydna, that's part of the project. Nobody even knows where it is for sure, though it's supposed to be on one of the outer asteroids. Both boys and girls are sent, and there must be marriages and children, though probably the death rate is pretty high, for every year they have to select two hundred more from Earth to keep the population balanced. We would never know if our son married there, or whom, or when he died. We would never see our grandchildren, or even know if we had any. Hal was a good son, and I think we were fairly good parents, and had made his childhood happy. But at twenty-one, faced with a great mysterious adventure, and an unknown and exciting future, a boy can't be expected to be drowned in grief at saying goodbye to his humdrum old father and mother. It might have been tougher for him two hundred years ago, when they hadn't learned to decondition children early from parental fixations, but no youngster today would possess that kind of unwholesome dependency. If he did, he would never have been selected for Lydna in the first place. That's one comfort we have. It's a sort of proof we had reared a child far above the average. It was just weakness in me to half-wish that Hal hadn't been so healthy, so handsome, so intelligent, so fine in character. They were a wonderful lot. We said our goodbyes in an enormous room of the spaceport, with this year's two hundred selectees there from all over Earth, each with relatives and whoever else had permission to make the last visit. I suppose it's a matter of accommodations and transportation, for nobody's allowed more than three, so it was mostly parents with a few brothers, sisters, and sweethearts or friends. The selectees themselves choose the names, after all, they've had two weeks after they were notified to say goodbye to everyone else who matters to them. Most of the time, all I could keep my mind on was Hal, trying to fix forever in my memory every last detail of him. We had dozens of sound stereos, of course, but this was the last time. Still, it's my business at the news office, and has been for thirty years, to observe people and form conclusions about them, so I couldn't help noticing with a professional eye some of the rest of the selectees. This farewell visit is a private affair, and the press is barred, which is why I'd never been there before. There were two kinds of selectees that stood out in my mind. One was those who had nobody at all to see them off. Completely alone, poor kids, orphans doubtless, with no families and apparently not even friends near enough to matter. But in a way, they would be the happiest. Life on Earth couldn't have been very rewarding for them, and on Lydna they might find companionship. If only companionship and misery, I thought. But I shied away from that. In our business, there are always leaks. We know, or guess, a few things about Lydna nobody else does, outside the authorities themselves. But we keep our mouths shut. The ones that tore my hearts were the boys and girls in love. They never take married people for Lydna, but a machine can't tell what a boy or a girl is feeling about another girl or a boy, and it's a machine that does the selecting. There's no use putting up an argument, for once made, the choice is inexorable and unchangeable. In my work as a news gatherer, I've heard some terrible stories. 
There have been suicide pacts and murders. You could tell the couple's in love. Not that there were any scenes. If there had been any in the two weeks past, they were over. But anybody who had learned to read human reactions, as I have, could recognize the agony those youngsters were going through. I felt a deep gratitude that Hal wasn't one of them. He'd had his share of adolescent affairs, of course, but I was sure he was still just playing around. He'd seen a lot of Bette Millen, a girl a class ahead of him in school and college, but I didn't think she meant more to him than any of the others. If she had, she'd have been along to say goodbye. But he'd asked for only the two of us. She was now a laboratory assistant in our hospital and could easily have gotten the time off. It was growing late, almost midnight, and Lucy and I had to be at work tomorrow no matter how we felt. I forced myself to talk, with Lucy's silent pain smothering me like a force blanket. I made an effort and cleared my throat. <clears throat> Lucy, go to bed and turn on the hypno. Try to get some sleep. Lucy stood up obediently, but she shook her head. You, you go, dear, she said, her voice firm. I can't. I... the roof buzzer sounded. Somebody had landed in a copter and wanted us. Don't answer, I said quickly. There's nobody we want to see. But she had already pressed the button to open the door. It was Bette Millen, the girl Hal used to go around with. I braced myself. This might be bad. She might have cared more for Hal than we had guessed. But she didn't look grief-stricken. She looked excited and determined and a little bit frightened. She scarcely glanced at me. She went right up to Lucy and took both Lucy's hands in hers. Well, she said in a clipped, tense voice, we made it. Then Lucy broke for the first time. The tears ran down her face and she didn't even wipe them away. Are you certain? Positive. And I got word to him. We'd agreed on a code. That's why he didn't want me there today. We couldn't trust ourselves not to betray it either way. I stood there staring at them, bewildered. What's this all about? I demanded. Have you two cooked up some crazy scheme to rescue Hal? I hope to heaven not. It would ruin us all, including him. The wild daydreams I'd had myself flashed through my mind. The drug that would seem to kill him and wouldn't. The anonymous false accusation of subversion. The previous secret marriage. All impossible. All fatal. Lucy disengaged her hand from the girl's and slipped her arm through mine. You tell him, Bet, she said gently. You're the one who should. I'd never noticed how pretty the girl was till then when she stood there with her face flushed and her eyes straight on mine. A pang went through me. If only she and Hal could have... No, Mr. Sturt, she said. We haven't rescued Hal. He's gone. But we've rescued part of him. I'm going to have his baby. Bet's going to live with us and be our daughter, Frank, Lucy explained. Hal and she and I worked it out in these two weeks after they came to me and told me how they felt about each other. We couldn't tell you till we were sure. I, I couldn't bear to have you hope and then be disappointed. It would be enough for me to have to suffer that. That is, I'll come if you want me here, Mr. Sturt, said Bet. I had to sit down before I could speak. Uh, of course I, I want you, but what about your own family? I haven't any. My mother's dead and my father's an engineer on Ganymede and gets home on leave about once in three years. I've been living in a youth hostel. But look here, I turned it to Lucy. How on earth can you know? Two weeks or less is no time. Lucy gave me a look I recognized, the patient one of the scientist for the layman. The chow vasalius test, dear. One day after the fertilized ovum starts dividing, and I ran it myself every day for over a week. That's one of my jobs in the lab, and it was easy to slip in another specimen. And it didn't, and it didn't. I went nearly out of my mind. Every time Hal entered the apartment, I'd look at him and he'd shake his head, Lucy interrupted. It meant everything to him and it would have just broken my heart. Mine too, Bet said softly. And his. And today was the last chance. I was scared to try it. This afternoon at 14.30, just before the farewell visits, was the deadline for viz messages to any of them. If I'd had to send mine without the word we'd agreed on, that would tell him it was all right. But it was at last. And now he knows, even if I never, even if, if we never, excuse me, please, it's been a strain. I'm afraid I'm going to bawl. We let her alone. Kids nowadays hate to be fussed over. Us, we'd lost our son, and that was going to stay with us forever. But now we would have his child to love and... An appalling thought struck me suddenly. I can't imagine why I hadn't realized it sooner. All this emotion, I suppose. Good God, I cried. An illegal child? We can't keep it. Nobody's going to know, Lucy replied calmly. Bet's going to live with us. 
and when it starts to show she's going to take her allowed leave, we'll take ours too, and we'll all go on a trip. To Mars, maybe, or Venus. One of the settled colonies where we can rent a house. Babies don't have to be born in hospitals, you know. Our ancestors had them right at home. She's strong and healthy, and I know what to do. Then we'll come back here, and we'll have a baby with us that we adopted wherever we were. Nobody will ever know. Look, I said in a voice I tried to keep from rising. There are four billion people on Earth, and about 28 billion in the colonized solar planets. Every one of those people is on record at Central Cybernetics. How do you suppose you're going to get away with the phony adoption of a non-existent child? The first time you have to take it to a baby clinic, they'll find it has no card. I thought of that, Lucy said. And it can be done. Because it must. Frank, for heaven's sake, use your wits. You're a news gatherer. You know all sorts of people everywhere. I don't know any machines, and it's machines that handle the records. Machines under the supervision of humans. Sure, I said sarcastically. I just go to my ex-newsgatherer pal, who feeds the records to Io or Ceres, and say, Look, old fellow, do me a favor, will you? My wife wants to adopt a baby from your colony, so just make up the names of two people and give them a life check. Invent their ancestry back to the time Central Cybernetics was established, and then slip in cards for their marriage and the birth of their child. I'll let you know later whether to make it a boy or a girl, and then their deaths. And then my wife and I can adopt the made-up baby. What kind of blackmailing hold do you think I have on any record official, I asked angrily, to make him do a thing like that and keep his mouth shut about it? I could be eliminated for treason for even making such a suggestion. Frank, think. Surely there must be some way. And then it struck me. Wait, I just got an idea. When I said treason just now, it might barely be possible. Oh, what? It would have to be Mars, the North Polar Cap Colony. The K-Alf conspiracy messed things up there badly. I remember, Mr. Sturt, Bet said excitedly. They wrecked everything in the three months before the rebellion was crushed, didn't they? Everything including their cybernetics equipment. Central doesn't want it known, but I have inside information that it's still not in going condition. That colony is full of children who have never been registered. And I doubt if it will be in 100% shape for the best part of another year. Those hellions really did a job. Let's see. This is the end of month two. We'd have to get away around month eight at the latest. And the baby would be born... when exactly, Bet? Early in month twelve. We could all be back here again by the first of next year, or even by the end of month thirteen. Well, I have enough accumulated leave for that, and I guess you have too, Lucy. Neither of us has taken more than two or three weeks for years. But what about you, Bet? You've been working less than a year. I can borrow it. Our director is crazy about travel, and she'll be all for it when I tell her I have a chance to go to Mars for a long visit. Besides, she knows about Hal and me. I mean, the way we were about each other. And she'll understand that I'd want to get away for a while now. Asher, my editor-in-chief, would feel the same way, I thought and so would Lucy's boss. I knew you'd find a way, remarked my wife complacently. I looked at the telecron. We've all got to be at work in seven hours, I said, if we expect to get through before the end of the afternoon. What say we turn in? You stay here with us, Bet, said Lucy. You parked your copter in our port, didn't you? Frank, I think we need a drink. I pushed the buttons. Nobody said anything, but somehow it was a toast to Hal. I knew the liquor had to get past a lump in my throat and the women were both crying. It wasn't like my self-contained Lucy. I guess she thought so herself, for she braced herself. But her voice was still trembling when she turned to bet. A year from now, she said, we'll all be back here in this room. And this time, part of Hal will be here with us. His son. Our little Hal. It might be our little Hallie, Bet smiled through her tears. It will be ten weeks before I can run the Schuster test to find out. It won't make any difference. Hal will never know that. But he'll know, way out there on Lydna, that his baby has been born. He'll know, even though he can never see it. Or us. Lucy blinked, then went on bravely. Every time he looks in a mirror there, he'll say to himself, Well, back on Earth, there's a little tyke with my blue eyes and my curly hair, and my mouth and nose and chin, who's going to grow up to be tall and straight like me, or maybe like Bet, but also a lot like me. And as he grows older, he can think back to the way he was as a child, 
and a boy and a man, and know that his son or his daughter will be feeling and thinking and looking some day just about the way he himself is then, and will be a link with earth and with us. That was when I had to go to the window and look out for a long time to pull myself together before I could face them again. Lydna is top, top secret. But as I've said before, we news gatherers get inside information. I have a pretty shrewd idea of what the mysterious Lydna project is. It's to alter human beings so they can adapt to the colonization of outer space. The medics do things to them to enable them and their descendants to resist every possible condition of temperature and radiation and gravity. They have to alter the genes. Acquired characters would be of use only in a short-term project, and this is long-term. But you can't alter genes without affecting the individual. We'd have Hal's normal child. But when Hal got to Lydna, he and the rest of them would be shocked and sick for a while at sight of some of the inhabitants. And if he had any children on Lydna, we back here would scarcely recognize them as human. Some of them might have extra limbs. Some might have eyes and ears in odd places. Some might have lungs outside their bodies, or brains without a skull. By that time, Hal himself would have got over being sick, unless, sometime, he got hold of a mirror and remembered the boy he used to be. End of One Way by Miriam Allen DeFord Read for LibriVox by Clatu at mixedsignals.ml slash cnc A Trip to Plutopia by Emmanuel Haldeman Julius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Burke. A Trip to Plutopia by Emmanuel Haldeman Julius. Plutopia is Greek for Hog Island. It is still in the experimental stage. The dream back of this venture is to try out the latest ideas in exploitation, and if successful, the plan is to be applied generally. Plutopia is the heaven of the exploiters, the haven of the twelve percenters, the paradise of the dividendists. It is a small body of land, completely surrounded by graft. The system of government is simplicity epitomized. In fact, there is no government. It is sublimated anarchy. The administration of affairs at Plutopia approximating perfection, there is no need for an organized government. At present, there are 50,000 inhabitants at Plutopia. All but 500 are working people. Let me begin with the 49,500. When one describes the first, he has practically described the last, for they are about alike in dress, habits, and tastes. They do not have names. Each has his own number and answers to it like a convict. I had occasion to interview number 31,497. He told me he was satisfied with the way things were run and hoped there would never be a change. He was very thankful to the 500 in the palaces because they gave him an opportunity to work 12 hours each day in one of the rolling mills. He said the first thing he learned was to believe that the 49,500 who worked should do nothing but work, while the remaining 500 who worked should not do everything but work. He confessed this was a difficult theory to get into his head, but, as his head had never been overtaxed in any way, he managed to adopt the idea. At present, he said, it seems that I always believed that we were supposed to work all the time. The plan is easy to understand. We have absolutely no worries, and, we are taken care of as well as we've been taught to expect. This point needed explanation, which 31,497 was glad to supply. An inventor in the employ of the 500 Plutopists had produced a pill, which was placed on the tongue and permitted to dissolve. Three pills went to a worker each day. It was considered sufficient to keep him strong enough to work 12 hours each day. As for clothes, Wood pulp was used for the manufacture of paper sacks, on the back of which was printed the number of the worker. One huge building housed the 49,500, each being assigned to his room, which measured 6 by 8 feet. The lights were turned off at 8.50. Once a year, on Christmas Eve, all were given free tickets to a movie. 
it was figured out scientifically that the upkeep of each hand was exactly eleven cents and four mills a day number thirty one thousand four hundred ninety seven said one good feature about the new system at plutopia was that the men did not have to take care of their families in fact they were not permitted to have families the women were housed in a separate building the children were sent to a sort of orphanage where they were educated to take their place in the industrial order when they became of age which was placed at nine years this is highly interesting let us now turn our gaze toward the remaining five hundred where the forty nine thousand five hundred were housed in one building there was a palace for each of the beneficiaries of plutopia having solved the problem of labor and having cut down expenses to the lowest possible point the income was enormous they no longer figured in dollars and cents they struck off currency that began at one hundred thousand dollars because they never cared to bother with less as it was considered very discommoding to be cluttered up with a lot of loose change while they believed it was ideal for the workers to partake of food pills three times each day they preferred to satisfy their gastronomical desires with more tangible edibles they imported chefs who were in reality arabian magicians who waved a wand and brought rare dishes from their culinary alchemy there is as we have already mentioned no government in plutopia the five hundred have things arranged so precisely that there is no need for a police force by training the forty nine thousand five hundred with the utmost care there is no need to waste money on policemen constables and the like as for courts they also were abolished as they are considered unnecessary expenses in the old days the capitalists spent huge sums in their courts but the science of controlling labor through psychology enabled them to discard the expensive system at least in this experiment station at plutopia one of the most distinguished looking of the five hundred when interviewed was quite ready to talk here is the ideal system at last said the plutopist unable to conceal his satisfaction i'm sure that it will be only a question of time before the world will follow our methods this is the last word in organization we have absolutely no doubts about our hands they are nothing more than hands because we are careful that nothing should get into their craniums except what we want lodged there there is the secret of success our hands are not permitted to study once they are given a place in our mills because study after working hours is tiring and throws our whole schedule out of whack you see we have just so many calories in the three pills the hand gets each day and if he wastes any effort we might be forced to give him four and that would increase expenses one-third of a cent which we could never consider besides thinking is bad for contentment we don't like them to think about anything but their work if there is any thinking to be done around here we take the job on our own shoulders what must be done before a person can become one of the five hundred the plutopist was asked nothing we have a closed corporation and we try to pass the property on only to our blood relatives sometimes we reach out and invite outsiders but the best method is that of inheritance we got it from our parents and our children will get it from us it is much like being a crown prince how about the forty nine thousand five hundred do they stand a chance to join your five hundred of course they do they have a wonderful chance if we happen to like one we could have him admitted to our ranks by voting on the question a unanimous vote is needed however but that doesn't alter the fact that our hands have an equal chance to take our places have you ever admitted one of your hands no not yet we may some day aren't you a little afraid that this army of hands might get organized and throw your friends into discard ah you mean are we afraid of socialism not a whit our hands are too well trained you already understand how we take them through our training school and turn them out perfect workers that is our strongest argument our scientists are now at work on a still bigger idea this is confidential of course certainly i answered not a word will be said about it very well he answered see that it goes no further we are working on a wonderful idea we see the possibility of doing away entirely with our expensive training school this was interesting urged to continue he added 
if nature is able to give us human beings with hands eyes ears and fingernails why not have nature go still further and present us with human beings who already have the ideas we try so hard to inculcate this was too brilliant for syntax they had hit on the amazing idea of breeding ideal hands it was almost unbelievable we'll work it out in time our hope is to combine the strength of the ox with the blind loyalty of the dog the self-sacrifice of the egg-laying hen and the mentality of the jackass it's revolutionary but it can be done when we succeed our problem will be solved for all time the interview at an end i applied for a pass to the training school being a friendly sort of person and knowing there could be no harm in granting the request the plutopist wrote out the order i began my tour in the kindergarten there i saw a large class of children all under five years of age they were being taught how to use words in unison they recited i want to work very good said the teacher very good now try to put a little more gladness into your voices with added enthusiasm the children yelled i want to work it was inspiring next came twelve hours a day i want to work twelve hours a day the teacher announced a little later that the children must say this one hundred times each day including sunday in the next class the children are given little jobs the mills were reproduced in miniature and the children were impressed with the fact that the greatest happiness would come when they became old enough to go into the genuine mills in the miniature the youngsters tended machines that were as tiny as dolls and yet able to do satisfactory work incidentally these children despite the smallness of the tools turned out quite an amount of goods but unfortunately the output was not enough to cover expenses this was the fatal flaw in the system and undoubtedly was the reason why the five hundred wanted to do away with it entirely and resort to having the children born with the idea of the virtue of work and the blessedness of producing for others as stated before when the child becomes nine years old a place is found in the mills up to then the total cost of upkeep for each child is four and six tenths of a cent per day i heard a great commotion the teachers were rushing about in terror something fearful must have happened i rushed along with them and when the opportunity presented itself i asked the cause of this excitement it's too terrible for words answered the person to whom i had directed my question it's the first time such a thing ever happened what i demanded the children in the kindergarten were repeating their lesson a few minutes ago and everything was going nicely they were saying i want to work as they should when one boy forgot himself and said i want a pair of skates it's too terrible too terrible and then trying to excuse the slip the teacher added it may be a hereditary taint it must be what makes you think so it has been reported that this boy's father is a dangerous character who will bear watching once he made a remark to the effect that he thought it might be a good idea if the hands got four pills a day instead of three think of it he actually proposed an increase in rations of two hundred calories or one thousand four hundred a week oh we must watch these hands even after the best kind of an education they are likely to get socialistic ideas what will you do if they threaten to go on strike for the extra pill oh there are plenty of ways of handling the issue if feeling gets strong and it begins to look as though they stand a chance of winning we'll give in to them is it possible we will give in but there won't be any real difference in the end let me explain they get six hundred calories a day and as we control the manufacture of food pills we will give them four a day but there will be one hundred fifty instead of two hundred calories in each that's one way but i don't think it will ever come to that point we have them too well trained yes plutopia is a wonderful island it will work as long as the hands consent to work but so long as there are youngsters who crave a pair of skates 
in a grown-up who doesn't conceal his desire for an extra pill there is a standing menace to the future security of plutopia end of a trip to plutopia by emmanuel haldeman julius